Hello, thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this video is called Basic Elements of Arguments. First, just as an overview, remember that we're trying to think of argument as a conversation, a back and forth between different parties. And these parties have a common goal in mind. Regardless of what their individual belief systems may be, they do have a common goal, and that is to discover the truth about a particular situation. So if you think of yourself as engaged in a conversation to develop the truth, to discover the truth, that will help you as you develop your argument. And arguments organize their information in a logical way, in a particular way, in order to make their case. And again, an argument is always a give and take. Even when it's just you writing, there's still a give and take in that you always want to be responsive to other ideas and make it, aware, make it obvious that you are responsive and acknowledge the limits and weaknesses of your own argument while at the same time making your case. When we think about arguments in their most basic form, we can think about them as having two, essentially two components. First, there's the premise or the premises. These are the things that you start from. These are the givens, what's given to you as fact or knowledge that you're using to make your argument to prove your claim. So this is the evidence, the reasoning, the principles that you're using to make your claim. And then there's the conclusion. That's the claim. That's what you're trying to prove. And the conclusion should be the result or the consequences of the premises. That's what makes a good argument when the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. So the conclusion is what you're trying to prove, what you're trying to demonstrate, the goal of your argument. So when we have a series of premises that work together, they then lead to a conclusion. Philosophers use the term syllogism uh, to indicate a simple argument, this premise, premise, conclusion form, where you simply state the premises that you're uh, basing your conclusion on, basing your argument on, and then the conclusion afterwards. So these are examples of some very simple syllogisms. All humans are mortal, Socrates is human, therefore Socrates is mortal. Another one, if it rains today, the picnic will be ruined. It is going to rain today, therefore the picnic will be ruined. So these are valid arguments, these are good arguments, because the conclusion has to follow from the premises. If these premises are true, then the conclusion is also necessarily true. There's no getting a different conclusion or a conclusion that's the opposite of what we've reached here. So looking at these, these are pretty simple and it should be almost obvious, perhaps even too obvious, but take a second to think about why these arguments are valid. Why is it that we can say the conclusion definitely necessarily follows from the premises? Let's think about types of premises. What can we use to make an argument? What kind of evidence or support can we use to prove our conclusion? Well, the simplest type of premises are just basic facts or ob observations, things that are factually, objectively true. Socrates is human. That's a genetic fact. The meeting is scheduled for 9 a.m. That's something that's been scheduled. It's, an, it's a fact. It's true. Very simple, but these are the most basic types of premises. We can also use principles or rules. These are ethical, principles, legal principles, scientific principles. These are more general statements than an individual fact or observation. For example, all humans are mortal. That's a scientific principle. That's a scientific rule. Only unjust nations engage in torture. That's an ethical principle that someone is making. Killing another person in self-defense is not murder. That's also an ethical principle, also could be considered a legal principle. So these are more general types of statements that cover a number of situations, as opposed to a fact, which is a singular thing. And finally, we have conditions or if then statements. If we do not leave now, then we will be late. So then if we know if we're leaving now or not leaving now, that'll determine whether or not we're going to be late. Or as uh, the lawyer Johnny Cochran famously said when defending O.J. Simpson, if the glove does not fit, then you must acquit. So facts or observations, principles or rules that cover large situations, tell us about a lot of different facts, and finally conditions or if-then statements that tell us the relationship between 
one fact and another, or one situation and another. Now, it's important to realize that sometimes a premise is itself something that is in need of proof. That is, some premises can be controversial or debatable. They could be the conclusion to their own argument in itself. For example, all humans are mortal. That's a pretty obvious statement. There are gonna be very few people that challenge that statement because it's a scientific fact. So that's pretty uncontroversial. But a statement like only unjust nations engage in torture, well, some people might debate that and say there are situations in which a just nation engages in torture. So you have a choice when you're making an argument like this. And there's always gonna be some assumptions in your argument. Your choice is, is this an assumption? Is this a principle like only unjust nations engage in torture that I can basically assume my readers will agree with, or I can assume that even if they don't agree with it, they'll grant it to me for the purposes of considering my argument? Or is this something that is so debatable, so controversial that I'll need to support that premise with further evidence? Again, you can't support every assumption. You can't prove every assumption that you make. There's always going to be something. So you choose which are the premises that might be a little debatable, might be more controversial, as opposed to others that someone might disagree with, but they're not so controversial that someone wouldn't be willing to say, okay, I'll grant that for the time being, just to consider the rest of your argument. Of course, just because you put something in a premise, premise, conclusion format, doesn't mean that it's a good argument. Here are some faulty syllogisms or faulty arguments, ones that don't work, don't make sense. And uh, let's see if you can think about, figure out what's wrong with them. All ballerinas wear ballet slippers. Crystal wears ballet slippers. Therefore, Crystal is a ballerina. Bleach is 70% water. Humans are 70% water. Therefore, humans are bleach. And finally, if it rains today, then the picnic was ruined. The picnic was ruined, therefore it rained today. What's wrong with those? Each one of these is faulty. Each one of these is a false argument. That is, the argument as structured does not prove the conclusion. The premises do not prove the conclusion. Why? Take a second and see if you can figure that out. When people are making arguments, trying to prove something in the real world, whether it's through conversation, speech, or in writing, they're unlikely to use the syllogism form. It's a very simple form, and it's useful to break down an argument, but it's not something that's going to be that effective at communicating to other people, simply because it's just too simple and basic for things that are complex. If you have multiple premises, multiple reasons to support a conclusion, then it's just, you can't just list them all off. The, the, they won't necessarily uh, connect with your audience. So real world arguments usually have more components. It's, it's not just as simple as premise, premise, conclusion. And there's a more complex relationship between the uh, components. Sometimes one premise proves another premise, which proves another premise, which then in turn proves the conclusion. And finally, we usually begin with our claim or conclusion, and then we support it with our evidence and reasons or our premises. Usually in our real world arguments, you say, hey, look, I want to prove to you that blah, blah, blah. I believe that we should take this certain action. Let me explain why I believe that. So usually we begin with our conclusion or claim, then give our premises in support, and then come back to the conclusion usually again at the end to reinforce it. When working with more complex arguments, it's useful to make a little bit of differentiation between the types of premises, or the types of support you use to make your argument, to make your claim. And we can differentiate between evidence and reasons. And these terms, evidence, reasons, these things are, are often used in uh, everyday speech as somewhat interchangeable words, meaning essentially the same thing, but I'm using them in a more technical uh, reason, a technical way here. So evidence 
What we mean by that in this context is concrete data or information, factual ideas that are observable or provable and that support the validity of your reasons. What's the reason? The reason is the principal idea or larger fact, something that's supported by evidence and used to prove your claim or conclusion. So this is a case where one premise proves another premise, which proves your conclusion. So then you have your claim, and this is just another word for the conclusion. When we're talking about it in the syllogistic form, where it goes premise, premise, conclusion, we use the term conclusion as what's being proven. Uh, in a more real world situation where we're using more complex arguments, we can use the term claim. What you are claiming is true and that you support, you demonstrate through your reasons and your evidence. So you're making a claim, you're asserting a position about a specific topic or situation, and then you demonstrate that, you prove that with your reasons or your evidence. And also just in terms of when you think about writing, writing essays, You've probably heard the phrase thesis statement and your teacher's telling you, you need to have a thesis statement in this paper. Where's your thesis statement? That's essentially the same thing as the claim. It's what you're trying to prove. Your thesis statement is what you're going to argue in the course of your paper. So these, these terms are essentially the same. Claim, conclusion in the syllogistic context and thesis statement all refer to the same thing. So, to map this out visually, to give you an overview, we have our claim, the thing you're trying to prove, and you're making that claim because of a series of reasons. And those reasons are based on concrete evidence or facts. Another way to say it, sort of reversing it, is that you have a set of facts, observations, your evidence, that evidence proves a principle or concept, it proves a certain reason, it demonstrates that a certain situation is, is the case, and that reason is what proves or supports your overall claim. Let's do a simple example. Going back to our picnic argument. If it rains, the picnic will be ruined. It's going to rain, therefore the picnic will be ruined. Let's look at it in this more complex form where we're not just having premises and conclusions, but different types of premises, evidence and reasons leading to our claim. So the claim I want to make is the picnic is going to be ruined. That's what I'm wishing to prove. The reason that the picnic is going to be ruined, it's going to rain. That's why I'm making the claim that it's, the picnic will be ruined. At this stage, we're still at the same level as the simple syllogistic form. If it rains, it's going to be ruined. It's going to rain, therefore it's going to be ruined. What we do now is we add another layer, another level of support in the form of concrete evidence. There are dark clouds in the sky and the news predicts heavy storms. Those are the concrete details or facts that prove that it's going to rain, which in turn proves, supports my claim that the picnic is going to be ruined. So, what we're doing here is, again, adding another level of support, making the argument stronger by giving it concrete details and facts to prove the principle, the idea that, or prove the truth of the, the reason that makes the claim itself true. Now, I mentioned assumptions before. I want to talk about them a little bit more uh, detailed here. Assumptions, or what are sometimes called warrants, these are what connect the reason to the claim or the evidence to your reason. These are things that are assumed to be true, but are not made explicit in your argument. And again, all arguments contain assumptions. The goal is to try to make the assumptions as uncontroversial, as basic, as simple, and as obvious as possible. To not assume anything really complex, really controversial, really strange that your readers or the, your audience that you're trying to convince might not buy. So let's go back to that argument and see where the assumption or warrant is. So let's review it this time from the bottom up. I have the evidence of dark clouds in the sky and the news predicting heavy storms. Because of those facts, that leads me to the idea that it is going to rain. Those are details that point to rain. 
And the rain is the reason that I think that I make the conclusion the picnic is going to be ruined. Fairly simple. But the question that we ask is, why will rain ruin the picnic? What is it that demonstrates? We can see why the evidence leads to the, the, the reason. Those are things that point to or suggest rain. But why is it that rain is necessarily going to ruin the picnic? This is where the assumption or warrant comes in. There are dark clouds in the sky and the news predicts heavy storms. These facts lead me to the, the idea that it's going to rain. And because it is going to rain, I conclude that the picnic is going to be ruined. And I believe that the picnic is going to be ruined because of the rain, because having a picnic in the rain is no fun. Or something like the water will destroy all the food, something like that. Right. So that's the assumption that connects the reason it's going to rain to the claim the picnic's going to be ruined. So here you can see an example of a very simple argument, an everyday argument that someone might have um, with their mother about why they need new shoes. And as you can see, there's evidence, there's a claim, there are reasons, and there's a response to those reasons from the mother. Uh, there's statements about why the evidence is not representative or not persuasive. So this is just an example of a basic argument to show you that this is something that you engage in every day, this kind of thought process. Let's break down the idea of claims a little further. Um, in broad general sense, there are two types of claims we can think about. There's conceptual claims. That's where you're making a case for a new or different understanding of a topic or situation. And so these can be claims of fact, definition, cause, value. Um, and then there are practical claims where you're arguing not for a different way of understanding something, but you're arguing for a particular course of action. So conceptual claims and practical claims. One thing to do is to think about for your research project, are you trying to make a conceptual claim or are you making a practical claim? Going a little bit further in depth, we have claims of fact or existence, like average global temperatures have risen to unprecedented levels in recent decades. It's a claim that is making a statement about what is the case. Claims of definition and classification Right? arguing that birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs, not reptiles. That's defining what something is. Claims of cause and consequence. Exposure to asbestos is a leading contributor to lung cancer, saying that something is involved in causing or contributing to another situation. Claims of evaluation or appraisal. 2001 is the most influential science fiction film in American cinema. It's saying that this thing is worth so much. And these first four are all conceptual claims because they're all, again, asking us to understand something in a particular way. And then we have claims of action or policy. This is a practical claim. The Texas legislature should increase funding to public schools, making a case for something to be done, not just something to be understood differently. When making your claim, one really important thing is to be specific and to use precise language. Now, of course, this is something that you might not be able to do at the beginning of the process of research, but as you go on, your claim is going to become more and more specific as you learn more, as you understand the topic more. So here's an example of, on the left hand, a very weak claim that's too vague, and then on the right, a much stronger claim that is more precise. TV inflates estimates of crime rates. That's a very vague claim. And we might ask some questions. Everything on TV does this? Uh, inflates it by how much? And then, of course, who cares? Why is this important? The better claim, although it doesn't answer all those questions, it does start to. Graphic reports of violence on local TV news. Okay, so now we know specifically what on TV is inflating the crime rate. And who is it? Who is it that is believing this inflated estimate? The regular viewers who over uh, who watch this. And then how much is it inflating this crime rate? As much as 150%.
And this is also, again, starting to tell us who cares about this. Well, the viewers of local TV, people with families, and so and so forth. Another thing that you can do to make your claim stronger is to elaborate it in some sense. Um, so you can qualify your claim with an although or even though statement or something like that. And this can add context to your claim. So for example, in the one that we were looking at on the last slide, we might add, although violent crime is violent crime is actually decreasing, graphic reports of violence on TV news, blah, blah, blah. So that gives us the context that this overestimation is, incur is occurring within a situation where crime is actually decreasing. So this is also starting to suggest why this might be a problem, why we should care, because there isn't as much crime and we're being too paranoid or anxious about it. You can also conclude your claim with some sort of explanatory reason that begins with be because. And this will foreshadow or announce, suggest some of the focus of your argument. So again, with that claim, the last claim from the last slide, graphic reports cause people to overestimate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because local TV news broadcasts begin with criminal reports making people believe that crime is occurring right outside their doors. So these are both ways that you can elaborate your claim, make it more specific, make it stronger, make it more contextual, and show that you understand the subject and start leading your reader towards the argument that you're going to be making in your essay. Now, on to reasons. Reasons are assertions that support a claim, again. So we should do X, that's your claim, because of Y. We should believe X because of Y. So some examples. Average global temperatures have risen, blah, 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 because of increases in greenhouse gases. Birds are the descendants of dinosaurs, blah, 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 because they have more DNA in common with dinosaurs. The Texas legislature should increase education funding because greater funding leads to increased student success. So these are the reasons that you're using, the things that you're going to prove to support your overall claim. And you might want to note that each reason is itself a claim, a subclaim that could be analyzed and supported by reasons of its own. So the statement, because greater funding leads to increased student success, that's a claim that would need its own reasons and evidence to support it if you were to go down up that particular road of analysis. Now, as you think about claims and reasons, you want to be aware that sophisticated claims of the sort that you're going to be making in your paper require multiple reasons, not just one thing that supports that claim, but there will be multiple reasons to believe it, to take that course of action, to understand this new knowledge about the situation. So some questions to consider. Why do you think that claim is the case? What are all the things that you can think of that support your belief in a particular statement, in a particular claim? And ask yourself, what do I need to prove in order to demonstrate that this claim is the case? What are the things I need to show people in order to get them to agree with me? And then what ideas are relevant to my claim? What subjects or issues are going to be relevant that might help support it? And this will help you to think about the reasons that you're going to need to investigate and find evidence for in order to support your overall thesis, your overall claim. Now, evidence. These, this is the information and data that supports your reasoning. So this is what you would use. So for example, if you were to make the argument about birds being the descendants of dinosaurs, then the reason is for because they have more DNA in common, the evidence would be some sort of study that actually shows the DNA. So that says that birds have 97% of their DNA in common with dinosaurs due to certain types of scientific tests, whereas reptiles are shown to only have 75% of DNA, or whatever the numbers might be. So this is the data that supports your reason. And this can come in many forms. It could be statistics, hard numbers. It could be anecdotes, 
can be historical records or narratives, can be written texts or statements by individuals, can be scientific experiments, can be from pure logic or analysis of a situation. So these are all different types of evidence and they provide different forms of backup to your, to your argument, to your reasons. And also, of course, be aware that any evidence is itself shaped and manipulated in some way. So even if you're relying on statistics, the way in which those statistics have been collected, the types of questions that were asked, if it's an interview, uh, the sample size, all those sorts of things, how even the statistics are represented will shape and manipulate that evidence. So there's nothing that's quite pure, but you want to get as concrete as possible, generally speaking, when you're looking for your evidence. Okay, we've talked about reasons and evidence a number of times. I've tried to give you some different examples of, of both and explain the difference. Let's think about the difference one more time. Evidence is concrete, usually. Factual. Something that's documented or observed. Something that's measurable. Something that is, usually speaking, uncontroversial. Evidence is dumb. And what I mean by that is... It's just individual facts without context that have no meaning. They don't necessarily lead to one thing or another. So for example, scientists estimate that hundreds of species go extinct every year. That's a fact. It's true that scientists make that estimate. We don't know if it's true that hundreds of species do go extinct. That's not the point. The point is it's a fact that they make that estimate, but that doesn't lead us to anything. That doesn't tell us, okay, well, what do we do with this? What does that mean? Reasons are more abstract, they're more debatable, they're what gives meaning to the evidence. So reasons are explain the evidence and they are derived from the evidence. So if we have this estimation that hundreds of species go extinct every year, what does that fact mean? The current rate of extinction reveals that we are in an environmental crisis. That's the meaning drawn from or uh, made out of the evidence. Some questions to think about as you examine your evidence. It needs to be sufficient, representative, accurate, precise, and authoritative. Right? So that means sufficient. Do you have enough different examples to prove your case? Right? If, you're only, if you only have one example that proves um, that students do better from increased funding, that's not enough to prove that the legislature should increase their funding. So do you have enough different examples? And this can be hard to judge just how much is enough. Is it representative? Does this evidence represent the general state of affairs or have you cherry picked one exception to try to make your case? So to the this very simple example of the child trying to get new shoes, he says, look, I'm limping. The mother says, that's not representative. You're only limping right now. That evidence is not strong. It's not uh, valid. Is the evidence accurate? Have you provided it exactly or as close to exact as the way it's given in your source? If you're not accurately providing the evidence, you could be twisting it or misrepresenting it or misunderstanding it yourself and this come to faulty conclusions. Is the evidence precise? Have you given the specific details of the evidence, if it's needed, or just an overview? And finally, authoritative. Where does it come from? Who is the source? And are they reliable, incredible, and so forth? So here's some examples, in particular, of bad types of evidence. This is something that's not sufficient or representative. You say, Shakespeare must have hated women because one of the villains in Macbeth is a woman. That's your, that's your evidence, one of the villains in Macbeth. Well, one, this isn't sufficient. Is one play, one character enough evidence for such a broad statement? And even more, we could ask, could any play even tell us what the author really thought? Could anything tell us that he hated women? We might say there's a negative representation of women in multiple plays. That is, itself is a different claim. So this isn't sufficient and it's not representative. Uh, not precise or accurate enough. A lot of college students graduate with too much student loan debt. Well, how much is a lot? How much is too much? How long has this been going on? Who says this, right? It's so vague, we don't really, we can't get anything from it in terms of support. And not authoritative. Lots of people think that Trump is a bad president, but my dad said he's doing a lot of good. Well, unless your dad is a published political scientist, 
then it doesn't matter what his opinion is, at least in terms of an academic paper. That's not an authoritative source for our purposes. So these are all examples of bad evidence. What could be better? How could any, each of these be improved or what different sort of evidence could be offered to try to make this claim or a different claim that's being uh, uh, promoted in these arguments? So to give a brief overview and review, we have a claim that is supported because of, or that we say is true because of a reason or a set of reasons. And those reasons are true based on the evidence that we have found, that we've researched. So as a very simple example, we should go inside, that's the claim I'm making, the course of action I'm proposing, because it looks like it will rain, that's the reason that I'm offering. And I'm basing that assertion that it looks like rain because of the way those dark clouds look. The dark clouds make me think that it's going to rain, so I say it looks like rain, so I say we should go inside. Very simple argument, claim, reason, evidence. Now that we have that basic structure outlined, I want to talk briefly about warrants. This is a slightly more complicated subject when dealing with arguments. What a warrant is, it's the logic that connects the reason to the claim. It's what tells you why the reason is relevant. So to take the example from the last slide, we should go inside because it looks like it's going to rain. Why is that argument persuasive? Well, because of the unspoken warrant or the unspoken premise assumption that when it is raining, it's unpleasant to be outside. And that's what makes that reason, it looks like it's going to rain, relevant to the claim that we should go inside. So a warrant is a general circumstance that leads to a general consequence. It's a general truism, an accepted sort of idea. And the reason then is a specific example of the general circumstance in action. The claim is the specific consequence that's made true by the reason because of the logic of the warrant. So in general, when it's raining, in general, it is unpleasant to be outside. It looks like it's going to rain. So that's a specific example of it being of it raining. So we should go inside in order to avoid that unpleasantness, the consequence of raining. Let's look at this in action. So we have this claim, Europe and North America will face higher health care costs. This person is making a claim about something that's going to happen in the future because climate change has moved the line of hard freezes in these regions further north. That's their reason to support this claim. Now, we might ask, what do climate change and hard freezes have to do with health care costs? Or in other words, why is this reason relevant to your claim? There's some unspoken warrant going on that's, that's making the connection between this reason and the claim. Since your reader's not likely to see that connection, in a case like this, you would want to spell it out. So the warrant would be, when an area has fewer hard freezes, more subtropical insects survive and spread new diseases, thus costing more to treat. So that's the general situation, the general circumstance that leads to a general consequence. In general, when there are fewer harder freezes, in general, there's more disease and thus more expensive treatments. So that reason, the line of hard freezing freezes moving north, will lead to higher health care costs in Europe and North America, your claim, because of that warrant. Because when an area has fewer hard freezes, more subtropical insects survive, etc. So this specific situation that's occurring the line of hard freezes moving north, is an example of the general situation, the general circumstance of an area having hard freezes. Since an area having hard freezes leads to more disease, in this specific situation, we can say that the line of hard freezes moving north will lead to healthcare costs going up. So to review warrants again, 
a warrant makes a statement about a general circumstance that leads to a general consequence. And when the reason is a good example of that general circumstance, then we can infer that the claim will result as the consequence of that circumstance. So we're sort of plugging these things in into the general circumstance, plugging the specifics of our argument into a general principle, logical principle. A little bit complicated, might take you a while to think about this, but again, if anyone, it's the, it's the answer to the question, why? Why is that relevant? Why is it relevant, this reason that you're giving for your claim? The warrant is that assumption, that logic, that principle that makes the connection. So to review, you want to think carefully about what you are claiming in your essay. What are you trying to assert is the truth about a particular situation or what should be done about it? Is it a conceptual claim, a practical claim? Is it a claim of fact, a claim of definition, a claim of action, a claim of evaluation, etc.? What reasons would support that assertion? What are the ideas that would, or facts that would make your claim true? And what evidence would you need to prove the truth of your reasons? What do you need to prove in order to, what do you need to find out in order to show that the reasons that you're offering are true? And finally, what's the logic that connects your reasons to your claims? Why are you jumping or why are you moving from the, the reason to the claim? What's the support there? What's the connection? What's the logic? What's the principle at work? And so these are all questions that you want to think about for your own writing, but also as you're reading your other sources, look for and try to specifically identify what are the claims that they are making? What are they stating is the case? What are the reasons that they use to support that case? And what evidence do they use to prove the truth of their reasons? And then finally, think about warrants. Are there assumptions being made either implicitly or explicitly? Are they stating why the reasons are relevant to their claims? If they're not, can you figure out what those warrants are? Um, and if there doesn't seem to be a warrant, then that might be a weakness in their argument. So think about these things as you're reading your own sources because it will help you to understand their logic and strengthen your engagement with them and your ability to use their ideas for your own research purposes. And finally, if you're interested in uh, a little bit more information or more detailed look at any of the concepts I've been talking about, I've based most of this presentation on a work called The Craft of Research, the fourth edition of it by Wayne Booth and a number of other authors, chapters seven through nine in the 2016 printing. So that's where you can go if you'd like to get some more information. Uh, and thank you so much. I will see you all next time.